Ooh, welcome back to the BDG Fantasy Football Channel. As always, joined Hi. by Mr. Adam, Mr. Andrew. Today, we're jumping back into our rankings videos. Top 25 running back ranking debate for redrafts. Of course, you've probably seen them quite a bit on the Dynasty channel. We're completely switching gears. Last episode, we did the wide receiver version of this. So if you missed that, that is down below. Low key, I've been actually most excited to talk about this. I feel like it's uh, going to be polarizing. This is going to be this is going to be quite juicy. It's yep. much more fun talking about redraft running backs than dynasty running Facts. backs. Facts. It's going to be a lot of yap sessions. I feel like in this for one. sure. And I also think whereas like res- the receiver position feels like once you get to like wide receiver twelve, wide receiver thirteen to thirty are all just like yeah, they're probably doing like a thousand and seven. Some they're shit like that. You know what I mean? Like, they're all the fucking same. Whereas running backs feel like their ranges of outcomes are a lot more fun to talk about. You know, yeah. upside and floor and stuff like that. Like, in yeah. Superflex, even. In Dynasty, you don't want to invest in the running back position because it's, like, it's a long-term investment, right? Redraft, forget that. Like, I'm good. I, if, if I think this player for one season is going to be in a great situation, I'll draft him ahead of a lot of wide receivers. Let me get them points. Yes, sir. Let's, uh, let's talk about it. So, we all yeah. got... C-Mac across the board, no surprise there. Bijan is our collective two. Brees Hall is our collective three. Gibbs at four. And JT at five. Uh, actually, yeah. Brees and Bijan are not our collective twos and threes. Adam is swapped. Oh, yeah, yeah but it's co- still consensus. It's still co- our consensus. Oh, I was just going down the top five. I, you want to get fucking mathematical sorry, about brother, it? Sorry, brother. Sorry, <laughs> brother. Consensus uh, means our, you know, yeah. averaged out. But That's, across oh, the board. You're, you're, I, you're right. Fair enough. I think for the most part, this is almost everybody's consensus top five in terms of just the raw players. Like C-Max, everyone's one. And then it's Bijan, Brees, Jameer, and JT in some kind of order with the tier break after that. Yes, sir. What's interesting in redraft, I, I, almost, I was thought about putting Saquon ahead of JT. I just, I feel a little more confident in JT and the offense that they're in. With Saquon, there's a lot of moving parts. I think he could be great, but I, I, I lean You JT feel more there. confident in Indy's offense and Phillies? Just because I think that uh, JT has proven without a rushing element quarterback there that he can be a, a GOAT in the offense. And that, yeah. that the, the old line they have is still pretty damn solid. It's going to be fucking electric to see JT get in those holes that A-Rich is going to provide him. Man, I want so badly to see A-Rich healthy for pause. a season. I think the whole offense – that's fair. Pause. The whole <laughs> offense could end up going crazy. Yeah, I think J-Mo had JT as like his number two or one running back overall this year, which I is mean, crazy. But Yeah, it is a little bit. Uh, I couldn't put him ahead of – could you guys – someone has him ahead of uh, Jameer Gibbs, right? I do. He does. Okay. Actually, you guys both do, right? Mm. No, no. Just just Nick. Just me. I. Uh, what do you think on Gibbs then? Well, with Gibbs, obviously I'm not like fucking super low on him. I was five, right. but I think that kind of coincides with – you see I have DeMont down there as my 17 when he's our consensus 20. Mm. I, ju- I, I just think that if there's anyone in that top five to have a down touchdown year, it's going to be Gibbs because DeMont is like the clear vulture on the goal line. Gibbs explosive – I have him as a top five fantasy running back, but if he ends up finishing the year with seven touchdowns, I'm not going to be surprised whatsoever. I would be shocked if any of the other top five guys finished with seven or fewer touchdowns. Yeah. That's so, actually a fair point. I think the thing I view it like, oh, I view it very much like Kamara and Ingram back in the day. Sure. I think that Gibbs well, is going to be efficient get a lot without. Of like, Kamara got a lot of goal line touches, though. And Gibbs on the back half of the season actually got too. a lot of them yeah, goal line did. touches. But yeah, right. to your point, like, I think you're, you're not wrong. Montgomery could still have a feast, and that could end up being a problem for Gibbs if he's not super efficient. Yeah, so that, that's the only thing is, like, to me, Montgomery is didn't show that he was washed at all. Like, just rushing purely for 1,000 yards, given the workload he had, I thought was impressive. There are not a ton of running backs that just straight up run for 1,000 yards anymore, yeah. especially just completely splitting the backfield. So I thought DeMont was good, scoring a lot of touchdowns. That's my only And missing some concern. time, too. He missed some time with some injury. And that, that was what kind of opened the door for Gibbs, too. And yeah. I wonder, like, if he didn't get that momentum to, like, prove that he could get up there how long it really would have taken but Man, dan campbell you, you imagine the dan me. campbell hate if that would have happened after they draft after they got rid of swift and then drafted him so highly i was Ooh, really i was ready to riot. Uh, people were pissed like I the first six weeks riot. yeah my, my, my thing too is like, just from a pure football perspective dan campbell like wants that toughness ingrained and that's what david montgomery pretty much encapsulates relative yeah. to jameer gibbs yeah. so that that's like my only like pushback on Fair. Gibbs being above uh, a JT or whatever. But uh, again, I don't think you can go wrong with either of those guys at the turn. We're not very much different at the next guy, Achan, here. But I'm curious, Andrew, you're at nine. Nick, you're at seven. Any strong feelings there? I can love that dude. Lightning in a goddamn I, bottle. I, I agree. Um, I worry about volume. And I think that's probably just why I have guys like ETN and Kyron over him because I can project a lot of volume. I think that's really the only difference. I don't hate any of these guys. I think Achan yeah. is going to be 
an elite running back potentially for our rosters this year. Yeah. With yeah, me, no, I, I didn't say you had. I'm just curious yeah. what your thought was. I actually have no worry about Jalen Wright. I don't think Jalen Wright is a factor unless one of the other two gets hurt. So, like, if I'm not going to try to project that, I, I don't care about that. I think A-Chan's a workload naturally will go up a little bit this year. And I was looking at the numbers because as someone this high in A-Chan, I think I got to have some logic behind it, obviously. Yep. With A-Chan, his numbers did not skew towards having bigger games when Mostert was off the field. His numbers were exactly the same in the splits with Mostert out versus Mostert in, if not actually better. So, like, A-Chan, I mean, just this, the type of traits that he has lends himself to having in extreme success on, on low volume. And I think he's a better in-between-the-tackles runner than most people give him credit for. I think he's a good pass catcher. Yep. They use him really, really creatively in the red zone. So, I, I just think if his role goes up a little bit, which is going to happen, like, he should just be a fucking... I understand there's a lot of risk taking a guy like this that early, but yeah. I'm okay gambling on that. And, and maybe that's what my nine is, is just hedging that bet just a tiny bit. Sure. But uh, yeah. obviously, HN, he's a guy who put up 50-point weeks for us last year. Yeah, yeah I, I, did, I did a little digging on him. The league winningness that HN has, I think, is I think we know, but maybe don't quite have exactly. Last year, in week one, he didn't play. Week two, he played 10% of snaps, so they, they barely even put him on the field. If you remember, he got hurt for a while after the bye. He played like another handful of snaps and missed that whole game, oh. including those two games points per game. He beat all the rookies last year. Nice. Like basically with him, I, I just, I'm <laughs> Andrew dr- goes nice. <laughs> Still want yeah. Bijan and Gibbs I, over I, him. I, I appreciate, I appreciate <laughs> nice. the, uh, I don't know if that was nice for him or nice for me, but I'll appreciate it either way. Emotion went crazy there. <laughs> but, like, the way I roster construct, I don't actually care necessarily. I'd prefer opportunity than anything. But I actually feel like Devon Chain's frame, I don't want him to get anywhere near bell cow back. Like, uh, almost like Hell Gibbs, no. but a lower level, where I want him to be in this 50%, 60% range. And you just play him every week. So there's going to be some weeks where he lets you down. But this upside that he carries on a weekly basis is unmatched, honestly, including the, the goats at the top. I think that's a super – like, I actually don't see – Obviously, Gibbs started getting a bigger workload, and I think some of that was due to the Montgomery injury. I really don't <laughs> see the two of them that differently, HN and Gibbs, in terms of what they bring really? to their offense, in terms of explosiveness. I think I think Gibbs is the version of HN that gets more volume. Yeah. Like that's really what it comes down to. And if HN can get a little bit more volume, he's maybe Gibbs. G- Gibbs is a more complete version. I don't think realistically people understand. I don't think you want him to get an eighty percent snap share where he has a chance to break down. And you know, guy that checked in sub two hundred as a uh, at the combine. Really talented player, but he just needs that 50, 60%, 65% snap share. He could eat. You saw it all last year, even yeah. with Montgomery there. Yeah. I think Reports, they're H-Hans. saying he bulked up a little bit this year. I don't know if H-Hans? I really, yeah. I, yeah. I Yeah. I don't really buy Conjecture those Conjecture season is crazy, but yeah. if he did, I mean. Sure. Everyone's uh, either gaining weight or losing weight right yeah, now. Yeah, no it's one like stays Najee's the same. 15 pounds lighter. Like, everybody's whatever. Yeah, he can give sure. those to, to H-Hans. Facts. I love that. The other thing, too, is, like, uh, if he did bulk up a little bit and they give him more workload, the comp that everyone from the beginning was trying to pair him to, like, high-end comp, Chris Johnson. And yeah. I think that's – I'm not expecting that, but I think that is – if he ends up getting 60%, 70% of the work, he could be crazy. Yeah, a chance of fucking – In that offense, God too, it's send. like, how do you pre- – you can't prep for him. He's outrageous. He's so good. All right, so a chance 7, Derrick Henry 8, ETN 9, Kyron Williams rounding out at 10. We had a super fucking long debate. About w. Kyron Williams Nick in, at nine. in the buy, sell, hold. I mean, I had him <laughs> you, at, at eight. Yeah, you were buying at eight. Yeah, I'll buy a fucking nine. I'll buy third round, fourth round, second round, first round. I don't give a fuck. I'll buy Kyron everywhere. Oh. Um, right, That's okay. <laughs> we had a very long debate about Kyron Williams in the buy, sell, hold video that we put up on the channel last week. So if you want to see that, we'll link the video as well as put a timestamp in it down below. Tony, please do that. Uh, uh, and we'll move Tony. on. We got Pacheco at 11. Rashad White at 12, James Cook 13, Josh Jacobs at 14, Joe Mixon at 15. Not a ton of movement there. Uh, we're, we're all relatively high on Pacheco. You got him top 10, and I got no problems with that. We're, you know, we're all on the same page with opportunity team, everything. Yep. You know what? I, uh, we have our little differences, but I was a little surprised looking at this for the first time how like-minded we are on a lot of the – even when we're different, it's like by a few spots. We have so many yeah. of these guys like we're – 14 for Jacobs is lower than consensus, and we're all, like, in the same exact range. It's kind of yeah. interesting how we have a lot of the same views on these players. Yeah, we're, we're kind of tit for tat there. This is crazy, actually. We hang out too much. Yeah. Well, why don't, let's go into some of these players because this is the, the redraft channel. We haven't done all the dynasty uh, analysis on this channel now. Yeah, so you're, yeah. you're, you're into Joe Mixon. That's the first, like, kind of, I guess, relatively big differing three spots ranking yeah. here uh, outside of ETN. But we have Mixon, 16s, and then 13. Yeah, I mean, I think you just look at what he's been given over the last couple of years in Cincinnati and not necessarily been the most efficient running back, but he's continued to see a ton of volume. 
And obviously, he now goes to a team here in Houston where I think he is going to be given all of the volume in the world in one of the best offenses probably in the NFL this year. So not really worried about a Damian Pierce, not really worried about anybody else, a Jawar Jordan or whoever else you want it to be behind him. Jawar, Jawar Jordan. Jordan. Yeah. yeah like, Louisville. Yeah. You ain't even out pulling my name on the dynasty Louisville. channel. Mm. <laughs> Look, man, I'm not worried about any of these guys behind him. I think he's probably going to see a lot of red zone opportunities, uh, probably score a lot of touchdowns, probably get a lot of receptions. He's just going to be a bell cow, and I want that. And, yes, he's a little bit older. Maybe the wheels fall off. Maybe he loses a little bit of efficiency, but – I'm chasing the volume with a guy like Joe Mixon, especially in an offense like this. Yeah. It, it kind of just feels like a lot of these guys are in the same mold where, like, Rashad White is him, Najee Harris is him, where it's like there's just not a lot of paths where these guys don't get a ton of volume. And even if you don't think they're that good, which I don't think Joe Mixon has really proven that he's a great, efficient runner. Rashad White hasn't done that. But, like, what else is going on in that offense where they're not just going to be force-fed, you know, 280-plus touches yeah. with a lot of – uh, goal line opportunities. I think actually to kind of piggyback off of that, I feel like we should probably talk as a group about Najee because I feel like a lot of people are going to be upset that we have him so much higher than Jalen Warren because it seems like most people are either Warren or Najee and it feels like a lot of people have them close. We don't really see it that way. All of us see it as in Najee Harris is the starter. Jalen Warren is the guy who spells him. Do yeah. you got anybody want to jump in? I, there? I appreciate you including me in this one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> N- Najee, uh, like, I feel like it just fits so well. The the hate you just talked about is so such a good parallel. Arthur Smith coming here. The way that he just frustrates people and just in general. Load Najee up with a bunch of touches. It's not that Jalen Warren's going to go to the wayside, but I, I think that this offense is actually – more efficient than people want to give it credit for. If Russell Wilson, the pairing with him, I could see like this given sneaky, decent upside for Najee at the red zone. Still a guy that's not an efficient runner whatsoever, but a big bruising type style back. I, I think he's going to return better value than a lot of people give him credit for. It's like he had such a great rookie season and then the hate was so strong the last two years. I feel like it's gone too far. Yeah. You want to talk about, I think he's my highest owned player on underdog drafts because he's sitting there in the eighth round every time. And I'm looking at a guy who has, had 285 plus touches every season, minimum of eight touchdowns every season. Right. They've upgraded their offensive line year after year using the first round pick on them. I think Arthur Smith is a good offensive coordinator, especially with the utilization of, you know, running backs in terms of volume. So now he's going to eat there. What made him so great as a rookie was his target numbers, Deontay Johnson out of town. I think some of those sink back to the running back position. So I think there's a lot breaking right for Najee to the point where he's been like inefficient that everyone dislikes him as a player now and it's drifting into fantasy. And Mm -hmm. I don't want that to like over accentuate like the way that we should be drafting him. Arthur Smith got the head coaching job as an OC in Tennessee with incredibly efficient Ryan Tannehill and volume to Derrick Henry. And obviously now I don't expect Najee to get that Derrick Henry type thing, but Maybe light, where he's a. Uh, I think he could be a sixty percent player and gets a lot of volume. Yeah, um, to your point, Warren's not going anywhere. Like he'll no, be, he's he's going to be there. He'll, he'll catch sure. passes, but again, like let's not try to push a narrative that Warren's ever going to be the workhorse here. Because if that was the case, like they've had plenty of time to to give that. And uh, let's the even like yep. Last year, with the shenanigans from Arthur Smith, you know, using Cordero Patterson, using Tyler Algier, using whoever, Bijan Robinson was still an RB one. Yeah. He's still produced and yes he is probably and I'm I'm saying probably to be PC here he is more talented than Najee Harris but the reality is he leans on his running game he leans on his lead back and to me Najee Harris is the lead back and it seems like that's true for all of us yeah he also he just performed really well down the stretch last year and that's been two seasons in a row doing that I think it gets brushed under the rug a little bit people forget there was a story about how the first couple games, first six games or something like that of last year, he was playing with a metal plate in his cleat. Mm -hmm. Like, people brush Mm -hmm. that under the rug. They don't talk about it. And then you think about how he performed a little bit better in the second half of the season. It's like, yeah, no wonder he was not fully healthy last year at the beginning of the year. Yeah, the thing I think about Najee, like, so we have this kind of, we haven't talked about our tiers, but when you get to this range, like past, I'd say – Cook, Jacobs, uh, you can cut, cut it off wherever you want to. You kind of get in a hodgepodge range where I don't necessarily think any one of these guys are, like, going to be a top five or three running back, like, with what I project. Yeah. But at this point, I'm kind of looking to just check boxes. What I mean by that is a guy that I put in my lineup every week that's not going to likely disappoint but also still has some upside. That's exactly what Najee is. Last year, even with that metal plate, three weeks where he was outside of the top 32, and he had – one, two, three, four, five. Count them six top 12 finishes at the running back position nice. last year. 
So I just feel like it's, it kind of fits what I'm looking for in this range. You know, yeah. I, good, decent floor, but also gives you a, some high upside. Yeah, I feel like if you're going for running backs, the upside comes kind of early in the draft. And once you get down here, if you're shooting for upside, it's like you're running the risk of the floor just bottom, bottoming out. The upside comes with a risk that's not yep. that safe for yeah. sure. We kind of skipped off from Derrick Henry. I had him at 7, 8, and 10. Uh, Arthur Smith made me want to talk about him real quickly. I know we all have him inside the top 10. Do we think Derrick Henry can be back back this year, like to an elite, elite level, like breaking fantasy? We talked about how there's a tear break with JT, and I'm not saying Derrick Henry should be in there, but can he get in there in production is what I'm asking. I think theoretically you could say yes. My problem, I, I guess the the reason I would say no uh-huh. is because to have gotten there in Tennessee, like the offense had to run purely through him. Like everything was game plan Derrick Henry, figure the shit out around him where you got the two-time MVP, Lamar Jackson, that offense runs through him, where he's going to have to take games over. But the offense is good enough where there's going to be games where I'm sure Derrick Henry's going to have 25, 30 carries. Gus Edwards walking away last year, 13 fucking rushing scores. Like, no reason Derrick Henry can't get to there. He could be, you know, on his way down like most people assume him to be and still, again, end up with 10, 12, 14 rushing touchdowns. And I also feel like it's worth noting as well that Derrick Henry by no means has fallen off. But... There was a little bit of a dip in efficiency, enough that Tennessee felt comfortable moving on from him and still paying Tony Pollard to come in and be in this backfield, enough that last year, Tajay Spears was finding his way onto the field, still kind of yeah. spelling Derrick Henry. And so I think part of my dynasty mind and, and just part of my NFL mind in general, at 30 years old, you see some of the efficiencies just slightly dip. It makes me just have a little bit of worry. Yeah, that, ma- that makes sense. But I also think like when you're Derrick Henry at this age, you're you're likely going to be, I don't want to say a product of the surroundings for you, but like in that Tennessee offense, that's that's hard to succeed as, as yeah. any running back. And the Pollard signing makes more sense as they're transitioning to a pass-heavy offense. They're like, we want more flexible players, more versatile players. Like Derrick Henry's a, almost a one-trick pony at this point. It's like, we're going to feed him 25, or then our offense is going to be completely different. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the thing with Henry last year, at least for me, what I saw, I, I – I, completely understand the concern and, and you 100 percent could be right like he could at this point at 30 be trending the wrong way as far as how his body's and handling that it. i still have him top 10 for sure no yeah. i mean I, i'm not saying you're, you're, not, you're knocking him too much i just i get the concern for me i looked at it last year in the offenses before one of the things with derrick henry at two almost 250 pounds it's like once you get him through the line of scrimmage a head downhill he's just a load to take down Last year, he was getting hit a lot in the backfield, and that's how you really can stop Derrick Henry. I think the reason I think that it could be uh, he could end up offering that, like, ridiculous upside again, I'm obviously not putting him there at seven, but he is a guy, I think, that could end up finishing games for Baltimore. Like, this is a very good team. So, all of a sudden, it's like they're they're winning, yeah. and you see Derrick Henry, who's looking like, you know, RB15 on the week in the last five, eight minutes of the game, all of a sudden, RB2 on the week. Like, carry, he br- run, carry. boom, 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 boom breaks yeah. it down, and the carry. next, you know, a 60-yard run, you're like, Motherfuckers back. Yeah. Motherfuckers back. I, that's I can see that shit. Fourth the quarter, Derek, for Henry, go crazy. For sure. Cause I, I, Just start I breaking people's will. Have said it before this offseason. And like, if you told me, you know, in the future, time machine, whatever, somebody comes back and they say, hey, Derek Henry's first year with the Ravens, he scored 14 touchdowns. I need, I got one to ask Jack. Jack, as the, would grab you a seat here. Derek Henry. As the in house Baltimore, 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 Baltimore Raven guy, the Baltimore Ravens podcast, you know, you got exclusive access into the players where we're talking about Derrick Henry. I was saying like, I, I think his upside in Tennessee came from the fact that the entire offense ran through him. Right. And he's getting 30 carries a game. Baltimore, you got the two, two time MVP Lamar. It's going to run through him for the most part, but like Derrick Henry, there could be fourth quarters where you guys are up multiple touchdowns. He's getting eight, nine carries to finish off the year. What What is your gauge on, on Derrick Henry? His involvement in the offense. Do you think he's, he's like a 20, five carry a game guy again so when I was going through underdogs rankings and also just where he was being drafted in best ball I thought he was being drafted too late but some smart people pointed out that there'll be games where he has 12 carries 48 yards a catch or two and no touchdowns and he'll put up you know fantasy Gus Edwards yeah yeah a couple duds but I genuinely think that the upside of Lamar's never had a good running back, let alone a Derrick Henry type. They've already started to wean the run game off of Lamar. Mark Ingram people about to chew you up in the comments. J.K. Dobbins, yeah. truthers. I mean. Dobbins never consistent. Ingram, guys, this is Ingram the best running back yeah. uh, maybe of the century. I don't know. But the century's I, crazy. <laughs> I don't like. I, I, no, no, no. It's, it, it, it's amazing. It's but really like true. after that, like yeah. Henry put up insane numbers. So I think you're gonna get 
Gus Edwards at the goal line work, yeah. right? So he's going to score. I think he's going to score 15 to 20 touch. I, I, my favorite bet is him to lead the NFL in touchdowns. Like, what last the, year, Lamar didn't there? score. They, they stopped running him near the yeah, goal Lamar, line. like, doesn't, yeah. he doesn't, he doesn't score, score touchdowns. Touchdown. And it's crazy. honestly, the touchdown against Houston in the playoffs, I think that's probably, like, a little fresh in people's mind. They don't run him near the goal line nearly uh, as much. Yeah. And they just want to cash in on Henry. So I think there's going to be games now. Late in the season, when Keaton Mitchell's back, if the Ravens are up a ton, I don't think he'll get 9, 10 carries in the fourth quarter. Oh. Keaton Mitchell isn't a bell cow, but they are comfortable giving the ball to Justice Hill. Like, if they're really milking a game out yeah. and, and it's over, yeah. he won't be the one touching the ball. Like, McCaffrey and how the Niners— Yeah, they don't give a fuck. Right. They're yeah. up 30, and yeah. then maybe Elijah <laughs> Mitchell's coming in. But, yeah, I think it'll be a lot of competitive games this year. So, I, I'm pretty high on Henry. But oh. I do understand Lamar just never throws to the running backs. And yeah. Yeah. if he's going to, it's not going to be to Henry because you've got Justice It's still his game it. anyways. And, yeah. 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 I, my, my, I just keep going back to, like, if Gus Edwards could do what he did last year and, like, now you have Derrick Henry. It well, just it makes so much sense on paper. Yeah. And that's what I was just getting at where I was like, if, if – you came back in a time machine and told me that Derrick Henry had 15 touchdowns in this offense. I wouldn't be surprised. No, I mean, it's I, I think he'll score 20 touchdowns. Genuinely. 20. Yeah. yeah. I, I think he leads if that. If he NFL does stuff. that, he outperforms our ranking right here. He scores 20 touchdowns. He's the RB1, probably. <laughs> yeah, RB3. That's you what think? I'm saying, dude. Well, elite, yeah, elite relevance for sure. Fantasy is 20. Now, like when he was in Tennessee doing it, it was like, will he rush for 2,000 this year kind of thing? Yeah. I don't see that, but fantasy wise, yeah. He ran for 12 last year. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a long way away there, from 20. There's also, I thought that he was going to fall off a cliff. Like, it just, but he now is approaching, like, LeBron territory where you almost want to stop thinking, like, the way he is in shape, the exercises he's doing. Yeah. It feels like, like it'd be an outlier like if he's, he's this good being 30. It's like, yeah, right. Derrick Henry's a fucking outlier this of a human is, being. This <laughs> is what worries me because I feel like every year we're always like, oh, Derrick Henry's going to fall off. Derrick Henry's going to fall off. And then he doesn't. And then the year that we're like, he's not falling off is the year that he does it. Mm. Mm. I, so it would just be. What, it would just what are be, these rankings for? Season long redraft. dynasty? Redraft. Yeah. Season redraft. Long. yeah. 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 Season like, long. we have him at eight. So I think A chain above him is nuts. Like, I can – best ball, I understand. Like, he can put up a couple 40-pointers. But so can Derrick Henry in in the final, like, quad of the season. That's fair. Uh, but, yeah, A-chain above him, I think, is nuts. Dope. I think that – why like, why do we like Brees Hall? Maybe because of the pass catching. But is Rodgers a – does he dump it down? Wasn't that yeah, the he whole used, thing? he used Aaron Jones quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, Brees Hall caught, like, 75 passes last year. I might like him over Brees. I like – I think Jamar Gibbs is once Jamar yeah. Jamar Gibbs. You can't people are Lamar, gonna kill you. Yeah. <laughs> Jamir Gibbs. You know okay, why why Jonathan Taylor over Derrick Henry? Uh Jonathan Taylor kind of just feels like Derrick Henry but five years younger. Like both of them can rush for two thousand yards. But don't don't you fear Richardson a lot more than you fear Lamar? On the goal line for Cause, sure. Because if Saquon that was the whole thing people I'm worried are about so Derrick Henry. Does Derrick Henry still have the the, the capability to rip off 40, 50, 60 yard runs where JT can very much still do that. That's, that's that was where Henry's like upside came in, yeah. but I understand that that could be supplemented by three goal line carries a game. Yeah. I, I feel like Baltimore. Henry could score twice as many touchdowns as Taylor. Yeah. No, I, I think and, that's and more than Gibbs. like yeah. outside of McCaffrey. I do love Bijan Gibbs gets year. a ton of his value though. I think because of just how versatile he is in the passing game, like yeah. he's going to catch a ton of passes. He also is one of those guys that, Turn anything Any, into a touchdown. Yeah. yeah, anytime he touches the ball. Had to have that happen for sure. <laughs> anytime he touches the ball, it could go 80. Yes. So. Okay. Well, all right. Well, Jack, you've given us something to think about. Appreciate it. Well, he's out. I was actually about to move my hand. I was going to get up and put the other <laughs> mic on if we were just going to have him sit. No, nah, I just want to. Now we had chaos. He's, he's so close to Baltimore. That was that actually he gives perfect. Us like, yeah. Well, he gives us a good insight. He kind of confirmed at least what I was thinking where I think it exists. I feel like my ranking at seven is that I want to see if it can happen. I'm just not going to. I'm not going to kind of want to move Henry up a little bit. Did it? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Above HA? Uh, yeah, above everybody. <laughs> Literally above everybody. <laughs> Over CMC. Yeah, fuck it. Um, all right, well, let's continue down. <laughs> above everybody. I don't see Gus Edwards in your top 25, Andrew. That's Hell no. That's because you took him out of mine. It's because it's Kamani Vidal. 
<laughs> getting surprised now. All right, so Harry. we we taught we yeah quite a bit about Harry. That was actually pretty good insight. Let's get back to we were at Najee. Anyone in between there, and then further down, we want to, we want to yap about Dave Montgomery. We kind of talked about that, but you're higher there, Nick. I'm higher here on James Conner than you guys, and I just think we look at this Arizona Cardinals offense, and last year, despite no Kyler Murray for a majority of the year, despite really no real weapons other than Trey McBride. He was still very efficient, and I understand they've added Trey Benson, and a lot of us in the Dynasty community are very excited about Trey Benson, but I just have this feeling, and my projection is that James Conner is going to get the entire workload this year. They're going to run the wheels off of him because it's one year left on this contract that he hasn't really shown us any signs of slowing down. With Marvin Harrison in this offense, we're expecting it to be better. Kyler Murray on a full year. I just don't see any situation where, unless they're – comfortable turning this backfield over to Trey Benson quickly. I don't know that I, know I necessarily think they're going to turn it over, but this feels like <laughs> the first real sign that like there's a reason why James Conner could fall off and Trey Benson is that where he gives them an explosive element where James Conner's never really been explosive. My other the other thing with Conner too is we saw his targets cut were cut in half last well, year. I, I, well snap share too. Go ahead. I, I was going to say too that's you have Joshua Dobbs playing quarterback for a lot of the year and I mean, he's got like Kyler. That. It's like, not like he runs any less. Joshua Dobbs is not as savvy of a quarterback as Kyler Murray is when it comes to checking down and doing things like that. Like we've Maybe. seen, we've seen James Conner play with Kyler Murray before, and he's gotten receptions <laughs> with Kyler Murray before. Yeah, and I'm, sure. I'm just saying they use other running backs to be the the third down back. Yeah, that, that, that's fair. that I think for me is where my ranking is. Like I acknowledge that James Conner actually, even despite lower snap lower snap share down the stretch, still was actually really good. And then this offense could be good enough to put him in a very meaningful mix. But if I look. The last three seasons where he just keeps surprising us. We keep thinking he's done. 21, he's playing like 70, 80, 60% snaps almost every single week. Some of these times in 2022, 90% snaps for a large chunk of it. Last year, he played down the stretch from weeks 10 to 18, 63, 69, 42%, 76, 49%, 59%. He basically got his third down workload completely removed. That's what I'm saying. It's not even that, will they check it down? Without drawing that play up, He's not out on the field right now for that third down workload. I'm not sure that Benson's going to do that, but my concern is that if they take his snap share down and then if Benson even starts to carve into that, whatever that is, that's what my fear is. It's not so much that what he did last year can't be replicated. It's just it feels like they're trying to get ready to pass the torch from James Conner. Not saying that they won't give him chances, but it doesn't seem like they're going to give him the old, the old the OG workload. The, the other thing that I, I want to bring up an old conversation that we had because we talked about – these running backs and uh, Nick, I think it was you that mentioned that. Are we confident that the draft capital that Trey Benson got is actually going to mean anything? Because we've mentioned times before Tank Bigsby's and guys like that who come in third round day two picks and they're just guys in the backfield. Yeah. And, and I think we all like Trey Benson. Obviously, the community likes Trey Benson. We've reacted to it pretty positively, but I, I just feel like when I'm looking at this list and I'm looking at some of the names here. I don't view James Conner any differently than I view a guy like Aaron Jones, who we have as our 19. You guys have him 2018 there. Like, I view them kind of as the same type of guy in the, in the same type of situation. And we could even argue that the quarterback play and the offensive efficiency in Arizona could be better than what Minnesota puts up this year. Yeah, I mean, my, my big thing is, is the, that, that context of his third down work and pass catching work getting cut, where that feels like – Maybe it's evidence of what's going to happen. Where a lot of the times we have like, okay, Kyron Williams has, yeah, Blake Horm coming in. But it, it wasn't like towards the, over the second half of last year, we saw Kyron Williams' work getting cut, right? And then we're now getting the third round pick. And Travis Etienne's workload was getting cut. And then we saw Tank Bigsby. It's like the draft happens and we're projecting that to happen. But like we've already started to see the writing on the wall with Connor a little bit. I don't know if that was a Dobbs thing. I don't know what that really ended up being. Yeah. But it's enough for me to be a little bit nervous about Fair. it. I, yeah. I see the I see the nerves, and, and again, just with this being half point per reception, mm-hmm. I think I see some touchdown upside in James Conner, and that's probably a little bit more why I'm leaning on this because we talk about guys who could have double digit touchdowns. I think Conner's one of those guys that could do it this year. I, I don't think any of us really expect them to use Benson on the goal line. I think we would all project that to kind of be Conner's role. Yeah. I think so. Uh, especially early, for sure. To your point, yeah, I, I, I fully agree. Just because you get – round three, I think, is going to be – he should be given every opportunity to see the field, but he does not guaranteed to see that or actually play meaningful snaps. But last year, like, what do we think of 
Michael Carter and Amari DiMarcado. Like those those two guys were pests to the workload of James Conner. So I I'm not even baking all that much that Trey Benson is going to like completely cut him, but that's part of my worry. I think here at 23, I acknowledge he could end up being pretty nice, but I and I don't know that the upside is the old old James Conner. It's kind of where I'm at. Fair. My last kind of point here to just kind of counter what you said is it's never been a strong point for James Conner, but also Amari DiMercato and Michael Carter, we kind of, they were pests, but we also kind of pumped up DiMercato and things like that because Conner was hurt and banged up and he missed some time. And yeah, he was a waiver wire pickup for our leagues and things like that. When he's healthy, I just think he makes that run game so much better. No, and, it, it's true. He's been like such a underrated, like actual NFL player for a super long time. I guess my, my worry is Trey Benson, if he has that pest role, Trey Benson has a different element to his game where like Michael Carter, DiMercato, they're, they're not better than James Conner at pretty much anything. But, like, Trey Benson can start to compete for yeah. more touches. It goes from a pest to an infestation. I, I think mm. I'm actually – the way that you view David Montgomery is probably the way that I'm viewing James Conner. Okay. And I view Gibbs as much, much more of a problem for Montgomery than I would Benson B. Conner. That's fair. I get it. We're not, like, super, super far off, but I, I understand the bullishness on it. I can I get but, where you're coming from. Yeah, I mean, I, I just brought it up because that's a discrepancy. I'm, I mean, I'm, no, I'm five it, spots ahead. Then it's, not, it's not out of pocket, man. I was just going to run down the rest of the rankings. I got a few that one of the up about, too. Connor, yeah. 21. We got Zamir at 22. Swift at 23. Mostert, 24. Ramondre at 25. And that's kind of a big swap for us. I got him at 28. You got him at 25. And you got him at 22. I'm staying away just because... I have very little confidence in this offense. And Gibson, you want to talk about a fucking pest? Mm. Gibson's going to end up catching way more balls than he needs to. And I think that's going to be like, Ramondre is going to be, in my opinion, a really low ceiling two down back in a bad offense. Yeah, this is like one of those rankings where I'm like, I put him there and then I saw where your guys were. And I was like, it made me kind of look at mine and be like, do I need to <laughs> the yeah. rethink Be honest, this? did you tinker after you saw that, or was that just a thought? Oh, this is just straight out okay. of, yeah, like, this is what I put, and then I saw your guys' and I was like, hmm, I, I am a little bit higher, and I hear the argument for Antonio Gibson. I think the problem, too, is that I just don't think Antonio Gibson is that good, but I think he can I think he's a, atrocious. I actually think he's horrible. Really? But he's like a good athlete, and they'll use him in a pass-catching sense what I, uh what how do you mean by that like as, I a, think as, a, a, as a running, running back runner. player yeah. i think he's really bad as a runner he means really? he should be in the xfl that's what he means hmm. he'll be there in a couple of years so how do you feel about Ramondre then i think Ramondre is a much better runner what, do I, you I, would, buy I, I actually agree with that though was do that? you buy into this like apparently they're talking about an extension for Ramondre here in new england do you buy that much at all and maybe there's someone that like he's coming off a down year i could see them getting him for like a really whatever i think that extension. would give me a little bit not that it's really going to change the way that I view this ranking, but it would give me a little bit more confidence in the coaching staff's viewpoint of how they view him. If they want him to be around longer and extend him now, even after a down year, I think I'd feel comfortable with how they view him. Yeah. I mean, at this point, he's, he's a vet, and he's I'm confident in saying that Ramondre is a good football player. You know, yeah. So, like, I think you want to kind of surround your young quarterback with good football players. But Gibson just... To me, it feels really obvious that Gibson's just going to be fucking super annoying to Stevenson. And I think also another reason why I kind of have him here is when I was looking at this grouping, it was like, okay, I'm, I'm confident that Ramondre is going to be the lead back in this backfield. I'm not confident that Mostert is. I'm not confident that Pollard is going to be. I'm not confident that Jalen Warren's going to be. So I kind of just pushed him over those guys because right. I wasn't yeah. confident and I could project the confidence of him being the lead back, even though it's a bad offense, not the greatest situation. What about Swift? Swift feels like the clear one there <laughs> with Pat catching upside in, uh, in in an offense that has upside. I agree. I kind of struggle with Swift, and I think the reason why is because there's so much new in that offense and there's so many weapons that it feels like he could almost be forgotten sometimes. Uh, I'm, I'm less nervous about that when, when it comes to a running back standpoint because, like, you know, a typical offense, like – Running backs are getting 55% of touches in an offense. So if you're like the starter there, you're getting a good chunk. Whereas it's tough for wide receivers and weapons because, you know, we're going to pass ball 35 times a game. You have no idea where those are yeah. going to be sprinkled. And, to. and I also think, too, a part, part of that, which this will definitely work its way out. And again, these are very early rankings. These will mm -hmm. evolve over time. But right now, Khalil Herbert is still on the roster. Uh, Roshan Johnson, drafted by them last year, still on the roster. And we haven't always projected, and I don't think any of us have ever really wanted DeAndre Swift to be. I mean, we talk about Jameer Gibbs being a guy that you don't want to give the full full workload. You don't really want to do that for Swift either because when we've seen him get that or get a heavier workload, he gets hurt. Yeah. And it makes me worry about 
goal line carries or potential things like that with Khalil Herbert on the roster. I, I just think there's a lot going on. And again, uh, just so many moving parts that even though Stevenson isn't in the greatest situation, it doesn't feel as messy for Stevenson. Okay. I got you. I, I was going to say that the Gibsons had more top 12 finishes at the running back position than Reminder has. We, we saw a really nice season out of Reminder in 22, but like totally different coaching staff. This new mm-hmm. coaching staff doesn't have any like true attachment to him, the player. I think he's go- he's going to be given the lion's share of the workload, but I think that there's no way you can tell me that he's locked into a like true workhorse role with them bringing in Antonio Gibson. He's a very good pass. He's a wide- X wide receiver, very good pass catcher, very dynamic in his own right. Maybe not a great, you know, through the tackle runner, but I guess that combined with the fact that he to me is in an offense that like what I project is probably not the greatest. I don't really know what it's going to be. I don't think anyone does. Yeah. But I just, that's where, that's where my hesitation with him is. DeAndre right. Swift. I, I think he's extremely talented. I think that if this offense is really good, he's actually been very nice on the goal line. The biggest problem for me with him is like, can he stay healthy? If he stays healthy in this offense, I bet you he could return value. But my bank, my, my ranking of him at 22 is a lot of changing parts. And the fact that he, we don't really know what his role is going to be. But the, the Chicago thing you were talking about with Roshan, like they drafted Roshan. I think they wa- they wanted to give him a chance to take over. He just isn't. Yeah, he, it. he yeah. ain't it. I'm and, really and, curious. And Herbert, see. like, actually was pretty good. But it feels like they just Herbert's didn't want to give – they didn't want to give Herbert a, a big workload. I feel like they want DeAndre Swift to be the guy. Yeah, I'm really curious to see how they use Swift in the passing game. Or just curious in general of how Caleb uses running backs in the passing game. For sure. Agreed. That's, that's where his upside lies in because those other two guys are not pass catchers. I will say, too – it, it is worth noting, and again, I, d- I don't want to sit here and defend Ramondre Stevenson because I don't feel that strongly about him that I, I'm sitting here, you know, putting all my chips on him. But Tell us how you feel. It's all good. I, you mentioned that this coaching staff has no ties. This coaching staff was on the staff of Bill Belichick. Like, they were the Patriots' coaching staff when Belichick was there and Stevenson was there. So they right. do have ties well, to Stevenson. Maybe they didn't necessarily tell you to draft Stevenson, but these guys – know him better than a new coaching staff would in a different situation. Well, I view it this way. Like, the coach I ended up playing for, it, he had a group of guys that he had to play his first year, and then he brought in his whole new character of cast, uh, cast of characters. Reminder, Stevenson was on the roster, but they brought in Gibson when they had their chance to kind of address the roster. So I think it's more of a standpoint, I guess, to your point that you're making here, good good counterpoint. They, they saw him, they know what he is, but they decided to, while doing that, bring in Antonio Gibson to compliment him and probably take away from his fantasy upside. Fair. I guess relative to consensus, I'm just not. I'm pretty cool on Armandre. But like I said, he, he, I don't think he's a bad player. I'm I'm the high man in the group, but I'm like not crazy bullish on him that I feel super strongly about he's it. He's a really hard guy to be bullish on. I I think pretty yeah. much yeah. Some of the factors are just not. Some of the factors have he has no control over. It's not. Right. It, it, I don't it just. I'd I don't like the situation. For the most part, really, like everybody. 20 down, maybe 22 down for us on our rankings is just hard to be bullish on. It's like you're getting into the tier where it's like anybody. <laughs> well, one guy that I, as I'm looking at this, maybe I need to move up a little bit. Like when I, as I look about 21, 20, whatever, somewhere in there, there's one guy here that I look and say, man, with what I saw last year, even if HN gets more and we say that Jalen Wright is just the uh, guy in waiting, I don't know. Maybe, I feel like I might need to be move Mostert up and redraft more just because – He's so familiar with this offense and what he did last. This guy scored 20 touchdowns. Yeah. We just talked about Derrick Henry possibly scoring 20 record. touchdowns. Like, how that's insane. I've gone back he and just forth did on, this. On, on Moser a lot in terms of, like, where we got to rank him in, in redraft. I, I will say I think one thing that maybe went under the radar a bit is Miami losing a couple offensive linemen. Uh, I want to see okay. how, their, how their run game works, especially with Moser kind of, like, depending on – uh, a lot of the inside stuff. Don't know how the goal line work is. I feel like as the season progressed, they started to give HN more red zone work. And, and I don't even mean just like goal line carries, but when they were on like the 11, they like put mo- uh, put HN in motion and like use really creative plays with him rather than going through Moser. But like, yeah, if, if you told me Moser scored another 12, whatever this year, I got I have nothing to really say. Also, kind of hard to tell because. Towards the end there, they were on Hard Knocks, right? I remember watching a documentary of them. They were Hard Knocks in season. Yeah. Uh, and I remember, like, it was a thing talking about in the locker room, in the coaching staff, that they were like, we're going to get that record. We're going to get mm, that record. Yeah. So it was like almost like we're just going to force him into the end zone on some of these. Where it makes me think, like, if he wasn't chasing a record, would it have been A-Chan? Yeah. And what scares me like, a tiny bit is, like, most are low-key, like, didn't catch passes at all last year. I think he ended up with, like, 30 targets maybe or something like that which is such a low number for we, we remember him fondly obviously because his fantasy season was amazing and he gave you so much right. uh so much juice there but 
you know, I, I agree with you. Like, if that if, if it's not getting pushed towards his way, if they start to give it more to HN, I think we could see a guy that you're like, ah, do I put him in my flex each week? Like, does he get into the end zone? Like, almost, almost like Gus Edwards last year, in a sense, where you're like, he could go for two or three touchdowns every week, but, like, if he doesn't, he's giving me, like, 40 fucking unscoring yards. Yeah, yeah I mean, he's pretty – he's one-dimensional for sure in the fact that he's a downhill straight speed runner. Like, he's going to he, – he's very familiar with that offense, and he does it well, but – yeah, he's not going to give you much pass catching upside. He, he's really, he's actually extremely fast in his own right. People think of A Chain as that guy, but sure. Mostert has the the wheels too. Yeah, for sure. Mostert, yeah. Like I, I got no problem drafting him where where we have him. You know, I don't want to stay away, but like I don't the season last year to like push about where no, he probably should I'm, be. I get that. I'm, what I'm looking at basically, what uh, what I'm kind of saying is, I'm looking at my rankings right now. Like I I, I like Zamir White, but I I don't think I really should be putting him ahead of Raheem Mostert. DeAndre Swift, like DeAndre Swift, you can make your case for. I, I even struggle putting him ahead, uh, putting James Conner ahead of him as I start to think about it. James yeah. Conner's in a similar situation. We hope he retains that role, but if, if Mostert does that, he's going to do it in a more meaningful level. I, I think I'll move him up a few spots as I start to yeah. think about they, this. They also did extend Mostert, so they definitely have yeah. him as a plan in, in their you know in their future for a little bit. You don't think that was just a good job for last year? It could definitely could have been it, yeah. for sure. Let's let's end with uh, big girl Zach Moss down there. I wanted to talk Ooh. about that. Now I know we only ranked up to 25 so I don't, I'm not sure if like 36 was your actual ranking or you just stopped after 25. No I I, I remember playing with these a good bit. Uh, I definitely am lower probably than most people on Zach Moss but let me see where I exactly have him but wh- where are you guys at? You guys are pretty similar 25, 27. What are your thoughts on Zach Moss this year? I just look at Joe Mixon's role, even when, like, Samaja Ryan was there and catching 50 balls a year, like, that's what Chase Brown will probably be. What What's made Joe Mixon, in my opinion, such a great fantasy player over the last fucking five years is the number of goal line opportunities that he gets. Yep. They're fucking Absolutely. insane. And, like, I don't really know what Zach Moss is. He was really cool for Indy for a second last year. I don't think he's anything special, but that, that role could be special, you know? Yeah. So he's, he's, in my opinion, a high floor guy that I don't know if I see a ton of upside, but he could play all three downs. Uh, he proved that last year in Indy. He can catch some some check down. So if he caught 35 balls this year, 40 passes this year, I don't think I'd be overly shocked about it. So Moss feels to me like RB28, I'm super fine with him as like my RB3 or 4 on my team. For sure. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm very confident drafting him as the 3 because I, I think you said it. Like if you were to tell me at the end of the year that he was a solid RB2 for our lineup, I would not be surprised. I mean, it's just the same thing. Like I, I don't want to echo everything that Nick said, but for the most part it's like good offense, Goal line opportunities, probably passing work opportunities. And I also think probably a reason why I believe in Moss a little bit more compared to Chase Brown, who's in this offense, is they could have handed the backfield over to Chase Brown, and they chose to go out and pay Moss and bring him in and kind of give him this role. So uh, it tells me a little bit about how they are probably viewing him. And even though I don't think Chase Brown is a bad player, I think he is, like Nick said, more of a complimentary piece to Zach Moss yeah the offense is simply too good not for them to have some sort of good fantasy production in that backfield so if you want to bet on Chase Brown I like I don't really have a problem with it I'm honestly fine drafting both of them at where their value is in underdog drafts I think Zach Moss is like a ninth round pick Chase Brown 11th 12th I'm like cool someone's gonna do something good there so the point you're making about that obviously lose Joe Mixon move on from him I wonder if Chase Brown the way I'm looking at it and what I hear is that I think they're planning to give Chase Brown a bigger role than they did last year because he did so well with it but he's not a – they definitely don't view him as like, hey, we're going to give the keys to Ch- – he's not an every down back. It, it feels a little bit I, like like Pittsburgh. I was just about to say it feels like Najee and um, Warren. Yeah. Warren. Here's my here's my thing. I, I guess outside of some really actually surprising weeks last year, I feel like Zach Moss, I, I don't believe in the player. It's not even the situation. But if the situation isn't Joe Mixon versus like pretty much nothing, that's where I'm hesitant on Zach Moss actually being the Joe Mixon – True replacement. Yeah, I mean, a- that, that that is where I think the risk kind of comes into play, where it's like Alexander Madison. When he got this chances, yeah. when Cook was out, like he put up some 150-piece games, you know, and like really balled out, was arguably the worst running back in the NFL last year. If Zach Moss comes out and is just terrible, averages fucking 3.6 yards per carry, I don't really think anyone's going to be surprised by it. Uh-huh. I, I won't be. I mean, just because, like, it's interesting last year when uh, – JT has the injury holdout, whatever. That was a bizarre situation. Before that, his first that, three years, it was weird. All he of won that year. one, didn't he? Though, yeah, he did. <laughs> he did. Yeah, that was a that, Jim Irsay got got crazy on all accounts. But Zach Moss's career was like going into the sewer. He was like a guy that was just wildly disappointing, and then bam. What was that all about? His first three years were terrible. You want to know part of it? So I just wonder if that 
uh, offensive situation the O-line is Indy had was the reason why he looked so good. Not that he didn't surprise, but I, I just don't know if the – one, the role is going to be a clear, like, hey, you're going to take the Joe Mixon role. And then, two, from what I have as a full sample size of his career, I don't really love the talent. Yeah, uh, that's super fair. Like, I do think he gets a starting role to start. I'm not confident at all that, like, hey, we're going into week 13, 14 of the season, and I'm like, Zach Moss is still a starting back getting, you know, 15-plus touches a game. I'm not going out on a limb saying I'm going to predict that because I don't feel confident there. Yeah, so I have yeah. uh, the guys that are not on the list that I have. I, I have Brooks ahead of him, Trey Benson, Blake Quorum, Devin Singletary, and then him. I, I, I think there it's like I'm, I'm shooting on the upside and not the floor at sure. that point. That makes sense. All right, well, we'll wrap it up there. Good fucking job, boys. About 48 videos that we filmed today. About 50, 11 times. 50, 11, 50, 11 times. Uh, top 25 running backs. Top 28 running backs in the novels. We did wide receivers last episode. So check that out if you missed it. Make sure you subscribe to the channel here. Make sure you subscribe to the Dynasty channel. Make sure you subscribe to their channels. Make sure you just fucking click and subscribe everywhere that your eyes see the subscribe button. Even All if right? you don't love me, pretend to love me because I love you. Thanks. Now... Big Last thing works. I was going to say is that uh, if you have any suggestions or things you want us to yap about in future videos, we do a lot of it, as you could tell. Andrew alluded to, we do too much talking with each other. Let us know <laughs> if there's something we want you want us to talk about that we haven't covered or you'd like us to see. All right. We love you. Moochies. Nothing you can do about it.